Hi, I'm Cinnamon Cooney, your art sherp, and today I'm so excited to show you how you can do this fabulous tree holding a sun. This is a really beginner watercolor lesson that anybody can do at any stage of their art journey. So get your brushes, get your paint, get your paper, and come back and meet me at the table right now. Let's go. So let's look what we're going to use today real quick. I just want to talk a little bit about the materials. Right here, I have this paper. It's 140 pound paper. That's the important part for you to know. This is a heavier paper. It's cold press. This is Strathmore. I just took these sheets of paper and I cut them in half. So they gave me, you know, a nice uh, six by nine sheet of paper that I taped down with low tack tape. I have brushes here for the project. This is the most important brush I have. This is a number eight round. This is a black velvet. The reason I like this brush, and whatever you're looking for in your acrylic brush, you're gonna want it to have a beautiful point. I like this because this is a blend of synthetic and natural hair. And what this is gonna do is gonna wick in the water and paint exactly how I want it and release it exactly how I need it. I've got black gesso for later in the project when I'm gonna paint in the tree, but of course you can do any black paint or craft paint that you have, a little bit of soft body white for signing. I have a couple brushes that are synthetics for acrylics. This is a Black Pearl Zero, and this is about a number four. These are both synthetic brushes, and they have nice points. They're gonna work really well for me. We're gonna be using the colors Lemon Yellow, Cad Yellow, Cad Red Pale, Cad Red Alizarin, and Purple Lake, this top four rows. But basically what you're looking at, so you can do this at home with whatever you have, is a light yellow, dark yellow, a lighter orangish red, and a darker or orangish red, a crimson, and this is the lighter crimson, and this is more of the purple crimson. And I'm using this Cotman Windsor Newton Travel. I've used this before on the show. It's basically, we're gonna work this upper row and work a little bit of our palette. And that's all we're really gonna need to start this project. I'm gonna show you a couple techniques so that if you've never watercolored before, you can get going right now. Okay, so the first thing to do is to activate your dry watercolors by misting them. Whatever watercolors you're working with, if they're the dry kind in the little pots or half pans, it can help to mist them. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how watercolor works. Watercolors go where the water is. The pigment goes where the water is. The first example I'm giving you would be the paper being too wet, too much water in the mixture. See how it's pulling like a lake? Now the next example is what you're trying to get. It's moist, you can see the sheen on the paper. You're simply letting what the brush has go on the paper. And the last example is a dry brush. That means I've just taken the extra step of actually dragging a little of the water out of the brush on the edge of the jar and then letting that go. And those are three ways that you might be working with your watercolor brush, but you wanna do the last two. Now, this is a glaze I'm gonna show you and a wet into wet, because these are the two techniques we basically flip back and forth with, with watercolor. So the first color I'm gonna let dry, that's a cad yellow pale, and the second color here, which is a cad yellow, I'm gonna just add that cad yellow pale into it. See how it's blending, how there's a capillary response? That's wet into wet. The first color we're gonna let dry, and I'm gonna show you how once that's dry, you can go over it with another color and create what's called a glaze. So I've gotten my lemon yellow here, or my I think it's my cad yellow, and I'm glazing over it. See how that creates a transparent, almost like you're looking through a film? That's what we're working with. So get your brush, dip it in the water. I like to just take off a little extra, and I'm going to make um, a couple inches of wet on the paper that's about, it's around, it's about a couple inches in diameter. So again, you're looking to not create a pool. You don't want a lake, you don't want a pond, you don't want fish swimming in it. You want it to just be shiny on the paper, clearly moist, right? But not sopping. And that's why it's important to use those heavier papers because we do use water in watercolor. I'm taking my lemon yellow here, which is my lightest yellow, and I just pull it into the brush, right? Cause that's what the natural hair and synthetic mix does here. It just pulls a perfect load into the brush and I am letting it release. The brush actually does that work in conjunction with the water. I'm going in circular brush strokes. My pressure is fairly light. I'm just almost engaging just the tip of the brush here. And then the pigment flows out into the water that I have going on. So that's how it's working for me. Right, you can see I'm just going around, it's very light. Now I wanna show you something about brush pressure, right? So on the brush pressure, when you're pressing light, 
the brush should have a small kind of bend to it. The, the, the whole bend of the brush should be very gentle and you should be working mostly the tip. But if you're over engaging in your brush pressure, you're going to be pressing down in what's called like pressing the heel. So that's what you're trying to avoid is just pushing in. You know, I'm getting some more water and I'm going to grab a little of my cad yellow on this. But this is just my next darkest color of yellow because I'm going to be gradating out. You can see I'm doing brush strokes around the circle. So one side of the brush stroke is against the dry. Therefore, the paint doesn't just go willy nilly all over the paper. And the other side is next to the wet where it capillaries in, right? And so this is going to create kind of this fun tunnel ombre that we're looking for. It's really simple. It's really engaging. Anyone can do it. You can totally do it. And now I'm going to get my cad red pale and my cad yellow. And I'm going to mix a little orange together. You saw there on the palette. And again, I'm just going around the outside. Notice that I'm not freaking out about the white paper showing through. One of the great things about watercolors, you should let the paper show. The paper should peek through. I know that's the opposite of what we do in canvases, but it's what we want. I'm grabbing a hair here off the paper that came in. I just used my brush to do that. And I'm going to come back with the brush and soften it. My pressure, again, is light. I'm not, you know, transmitting from my shoulder through the brush to the paper. I'm grabbing now just my pure cad red pale. When I say cad in this, all the watercolors are hue. They're all hue. So it's not really cadmium. It's just the color cadmium would be if it were cadmium. So that's that particular kind of orange color there. Now I'm going to keep going around the outside of my circle, keep dragging that around. It's blending in. You can see the capillary pulling it in, right? I'm not working very hard here. I'm working hard to explain it, but I'm not working hard to do it. All right. So now this is my darker CAD that they give me in this. And whatever paint you're using, you just want the next step up in your reds and oranges. But notice that I'm taking the tip of the brush and I'm bringing a little of that color in, right, into the yellow, letting it bleed out, letting it soften out, and then back around the outer edge, just working in these circles. You know, I'm not that stressed about it, not that worried about it, I'm just adding the color. Because I know that as the colors get on each other, they're going to either glaze or they're going to go wet into wet. And both of these effects is going to get this ombre job done. Now I'm getting a little water on my brush and I'm coming to my alizarin. This is my alizarin crimson that's in the set. And basically this is just a cooler red than what I've been using. The two reds before were warmer. They had a little more yellow in them. This red has a little more blue in it. And so it's adding to that step factor that we're creating. So I'm working the outside. I'm getting a little, I get a little more water. I work the pan because of course they'll dry out as you're working them sometimes. Again, you don't want them to be ponds. Just moist, just activated, right? Because this is just a binder, right? The gum Arabic binders that have pigment in them. So you're just adding the water to release the pigment. And then the paper is going to stabilize that pigment. The pigment goes into the paper, which is kind of exciting. Still, just going around in circles, just darkening as I go. You know, getting a little more pigment. And you can see as I keep adding over and over that pigment, you can see there are areas that darken, but then it softens and bleeds out. And it really does a lot of this work for me. I really, really, really want to say again, I think paper matters. Um, you'll notice that I'm taped down, right? My paper's taped down. It, this is a 140 pound paper. It's really not going to wrinkle on me unless I were to like really soak it. But I still have it taped down so it's not moving. The thing to think about with tape is that it can tear the paper when you lift it up. We'll talk about that later in the video. So now I'm into the purple lake, right? This, this new color I have is the purple lake. This is just a violet, right? This is just a violet that has a lot of red in it. And it again adds to the gradation. I'm just still working this number eight round. I really think you can do most of watercolor painting with a number eight round sometimes. They're just a really great lifting brush. And this particular brush just pulls the pigment in and gives it to the paper. Pulls the pigment in, and gives it to the paper. You can see I'm taking some of that uh, purple lake up into the alizarin, up into the cad, just kind of blending it around. So this is still glazing. Now I'm going back into that cad yellow. What am I doing? 
Well, I'm going to load that up. And I'm going to come in and add some more focused, deeper, darker uh, concentric circles in this yellow. And some of these will be glazes. In other words, they're going to be over dry. I really want the center of this to be dry. So I'm really allowing this to dry. And if it weren't dry, I would let it dry. And then I'm coming back from this dry center, working into the wet spaces with this, with this cad yellow. So it goes from being a glaze to a wet and wet, which you're kind of seeing it doing. When you're laying that pigment in, you know, into that space, you can see it's blending out and it's deepening down into the paper, which is kind of a lovely thing that it'll do. And it's real easy. And you can see how you could totally do this. No trouble at home. Super easy, right? Just running this energy, these brush strokes around the focus, which is going to be where the tree is holding the sun, right there. Now, I haven't wet the area this time, and I'm going to very lightly sketch in about a silver dollar, about, you know, an inch and a half in diameter circle that I'm now glazing. In other words, the paint underneath is dry, and I'm painting with a wet paint on top of it, and that's going to deepen the color. Right? And so it's not going to go outside of where I draw the circle to the far side. Everything's going to be wet on wet into the inside. It's a good way to create this boundary. So I've got the darkest yellow that I've got, and I am layering that in. And I'm just pulling that in and enjoying that. And I'm making sure the shape is what I want. And I'm leaving light in the center. I've kind of done little concentric circles in. The little end part in the center end up looking like a heart, which was just fortuitous. It wasn't something I actually intended, but really was thrilled happened. All right, so I've got my CAD. I'm working the outside. And you can see that the cadmium doesn't blend outside the sun, but it does pull into the inside, creating a softness, which I want through this whole piece. So even though this is small, this is, um, again, a six by nine sheet of paper. You could do this on eight by 10, you can do this on five by seven. Just really try to get the heaviest paper that you can that's cold press, 140 pound cold press paper. So I'm just working the outside and shading it. A couple darker lines to the inside. I'm just trying to create this sort of feeling of energy and different tonality radiating out from the sun. That's all I'm doing. All right, I say okay to that. So I'm gonna grab some black gesso. You could use black paint. I just really like black gesso. It's inexpensive and has a very nice matte finish and is very fluid. I've got a number four round synthetic for acrylic and a number one round synthetic for acrylic. Check the description. I'll tell you exactly what those brushes are. I wanna show you about pressure on this. See how when I'm pressing really hard and I'm really bending that brush, that line is very thick, right, and filling. But if I'm very light in my pressure, I get a very fine line. Now that is about the tip of my brush being really refined, but also about how hard I'm pressing it. Again, I've got this beautiful number one round black pearl brush, right? Super nice. If I press hard, I get a thick line. If I press lightly and delicately, I get a fine line. And that is really gonna be important in the creation of my tree. Now I'm gonna start sketching in my landscape. I'm gonna take a line that goes up. I'm gonna to come to a point and curve back in. I want my landscape to be whimsical. Of course, if drawing is not your thing, I'm going to have a traceable on the website. You can check that out and you can absolutely transfer the image right onto the paper and then just paint that in. And no, I don't think that's cheating, in my opinion. So I'm taking this line up. As I go up, you'll see that I'm lightening my pressure to refine my line. At the base of the tree, the tree's thicker. And as I go up my tree, the line becomes thinner, more refined and converges into the previous line making an ever diminishing bisecting set of lines, right? That's trees, thicker at the ground and getting skinnier as they go up. I also like my trees to be a little bit crickety, a little bit weathered. I like to tell a story of this tree's life through its bends and twists because that's what happens to trees is they're really put out into the world. I'm filling this all in with black. Throughout this piece, you'll see me go back and touch things up. Um, sometimes in painting, especially on paper, you get uh, little pockets where it seems like it's covered, but then as it dries, as it contracts, it'll reveal paper. And if you're going for a really solid matte finish, you may be touching bits up. Again, I love the gesso for matte, but you could use black craft paint. Um, if you're gonna use a Sharpie or something, 
One thing I'd like to say to you is test your paper and make sure that the absorption of the paper doesn't create a really feathered uh, line with your ink. So I'm just going up very slowly. Um, if you wanted to freehand this in, remember you can very lightly, lightly, lightly with pencil pre-sketch in things, right? You can do that. You're not married to it because it's really hard. In acrylic, we can undo really easily, but an acrylic paint over watercolor paint does not undo easily. So it's better to just think it out a little bit first and then refine it as you go. I'm still like carrying these light lines as I go to the ends of the brushes. So that's about what I showed you earlier. Press heavy, get a thick line. Press lightly, get a light line. It's all about engaging and just if you need to, you know, just do, just do it on the tip of your hand here, you know, it'd be just like, this is too hard. This is very soft. A friend of mine gave me this advice and I was like, that does explain it. If you're bending the brush to the metal of the ferrule, you're pressing too hard. You want to just very, very gently engage just the tip of the brush to your hand. So when the stroke starts, you're going to be about a half bend and then as you go, it just lightens up and just engages the tip and that's how you refine that line. So I'm just adding branches as I'm coming out. A thing that I do on branches is I don't like take the branch from the same joint, right? Like fingers. It's, I would do my next branch at like essentially the knuckle. I'm trying to stagger these branches. Very important to stagger your branches. And even as little branches come out from bigger branches, stagger them. Definitely, definitely stagger them. These base branches, these thicker branches, this is the base architecture of my tree, right? This is, this is the basis of it. Everything kind of builds and radiates out. I'm not going to put branches in front of my sun where the tree is holding the sun. And I'm not going to do really short, stubby branches. I'm going to really carry those lines out as far as I can. So I'm using this number for it. You can see me touching up for those little spots I talked about earlier. I'm using this number four round to lay in the basis of the tree, the architecture of the tree. But I'm going to come in here soon with a smaller, more detailed brush to do the fiddly little bits that we've got to do to really finish this piece out. But already, like right now, it's looking pretty good. Now I've got my number one. This is a black pearl and it's a synthetic brush. It has a mitlon bristle. And so it's, even though it's really tiny and refined, it has a very nice line to it, kind of like a pen and I really like it. Um, and as you can see, I'm getting a really fine line. Same thing, pressure. I don't wanna be bending this to the metal. I wanna be just engaging the tip of this to get these little tiny little branches, right? And I can use this smaller brush to go back over bigger branches to sort of smooth them out if I need to, but that's just me being fiddly. You be fiddly too, if you want to. Notice that I'm really trying to stagger and move them out and make each little twig longer. Really, really elongate my twigs. Are you elongating your twigs? Make your twigs long and willowy. But yeah, pull those out. Also not making straight lines. The lines are kind of wobbly. Um, challenges you might have. If your hands are shaky, you may need to steady your hands on something like a bridge or a block. Um, you know, if you need to steady your hand at the wrist, that's okay. One of the things that can happen is you drag uh, wet paint, and that's another problem as a left-handed painter is sometimes because you're going to be coming from the left to the right, you're going to be dragging paint. So just watch for that, you know. Nothing wrong. However you're painting, you're painting. Just be aware that, you know, you might have different challenges, you know, with what you're doing. It's like, I can do it in pen, but it might bleed in the paper. So you can see I'm just... I'm pulling kind of like in a radiating out around it, uh, aurora, these black lines to paint the sun, right? And you can see that I'm just keeping those little end of the brush strokes. I even on the little fiddly bits, I really lighten that brush stroke to pull that little refined bit at the end to pop that. It's really fun for me. Um, this is a bit like Zen doodling. So, you know, breathe in. Breathe out and enjoy your Zen doodle on this, right? You can really do these trees. You can do this style of tree, especially in these little watercolor bits in a myriad of colors. They frame really easily in picture frames. Um, you just want to have a mat because we have acrylic on this piece between the paper and the glass. So you just mat to have a little bit of air, you know. 
Um, you don't need to varnish, but there's new varnishes for watercolors now. So it's really up to you as an artist about how you want to finish your piece. I find glass is enough, but again, never, you know, just be like, so no, you don't take the new opportunity of the new art technology that's coming out. You can see I'm pulling some branches down and wandering them out, you know, and I'm still not crossing the sun. I'm still cradling the sun here. I'm going to add a little bit of refinement to this sort of lower, hardier branch, you know, giving this tree some character, giving it some thought. You know, I'm really liking how it's as if the sun is setting and the tree has caught it, and that's really working for me, so I'm pretty pleased. And you can see I just like to, to wander out little branches. I try to imagine little leaves catching sunlight and feeding the tree when I'm just putting its little bones up, say, when it maybe doesn't have its leaves. Now I'm going to start creating some grass. And these brush strokes are going to be a little bit like the tree brush strokes in that they're going to curve and the brush strokes could be a little heavier at the beginning of the engagement and lighten in the flick and I'm curving to the right. So the brush stroke curves to the right. That's just my preference. There isn't a right or wrong of the curve. I'm just curving a lot of these to the right and then I'm going to come and I'm going to curve them to the left because grass doesn't grow in an orderly fashion. Grass is not orderly. You know, it does its own thing. It tells its own story. So to that example, I'd just like to show you something. So this is what I call the Herman Munster hair. And what it is is the entire stroke has the same pressure. See how the stroke is the same thickness from the beginning to the end and all the little grass blades line up like, 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 a, like a buzz cut at the top of the hair. What you're going to want to do is press at the beginning and flick off, curving the strokes, curving them sometimes to the right, curving them sometimes to the left. Either curve is okay. You're going to want some of those strokes to be longer and you're going to want some of those strokes to be shorter because there's no lawnmower at the top of your hill. If there were a lawnmower, then you would line all those up, but we didn't mow this grass. This grass is growing wild, so therefore it has to be different lengths. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So back to the grass. Grass, 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 grass. Putting little strokes out. Now, you know, continuing the curves, curving to the right, curving to the left, making some little bunches kind of stubby, making some little bunches kind of long, you know, both options are totally okay. You're literally almost at the end of this piece, right? You're literally almost done. So, you know, just thinking about it, it's okay to take a pause and think about where you're putting it, right? And remember, I pause. <laughs> You can put me on two times speed, you can pause me, so you have control too. So your painting speed is yours, right? Not my painting speed, but your painting speed. I'm going to take some little bits of grass off the edge of my whimsical cliff because I think it adds to that line, to that element. And I like to think about how things add to those elements always in all things. And I'm putting a little bunch of grass at kind of coming off and on the canvas. You can see a lot of my brush strokes went right over the tape. I'm rinsing out my brushes uh, really well. Make sure you're really, really, really washing out your acrylic brushes. I'm putting out a little white paint and I'm going to make a very dark gray to sign my painting. I want my signature to be there. I want it to be viewable to the viewer so that they can read it, but I also want it to be part of the piece, right? So that's something that I did there and it's not really going to show up on camera, but it's there. It's, just a, it's like two shades up from the background. Now here's the thing, we talked about it earlier about the tape. Tape is great, keeps wrinkles and valleys from happening, right? Keeps those mountains and all those areas, but if you pushed it down too hard, it tears. Did you notice that I counterbalanced that with my finger? That's how I kept that tear from getting crazy. So something to think about, you know, that's why we do low tack tape, that's why we don't press down too hard on it. And to repair that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back with a little of the alizarin crimson and CAD later in just blend out that edge and you won't even see it behind the. So hopefully that was fun. I hope you had a great time. I love spending this time with you. I cannot wait to share more really beginning watercolor projects with you. Be good to yourselves, be good to each other. And I wanna see you at the easel or now paper really soon. All right, bye-bye.